Savannah Bee Company is a remarkable business founded by an extraordinary man with a legendary purpose. Speaking of Bees is a podcast that offers a glimpse into what lifelong beekeeper, entrepreneur, and activist Ted Dinard made possible. A mission driven by purpose to inspire those who believe in making a difference in the world. Through educating on the importance of saving bees, expert sourcing of the world's finest honey, and selling the world's purest honey and honey products. The Savannah Bee Company story started with a dream, and that dream continues today. By tuning in today, you are helping us get one step closer to saving the bees and ultimately saving the world. We left off talking about your high school experience. I think we are now into Ted's life in college, right? That's right. That's right. And then the, the bees ended up there too. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start, let's start with where did you go? Why did you go there? And if anyone's read your bio, they know that you majored in religion. So I want to get into college, major, bees, everything in that chapter of your okay. life. Well, right. So the reason I went, so I went to the University of the South, um, Wani, Tennessee, and it's a small liberal arts school up in the mountains between Chattanooga and Nashville, and it is beautiful, but it is tiny, super tiny. And I went to her in different colleges with my dad, and we went to Davidson, and we went to Swanee, and I was like, I wouldn't go to either one of those because they're half the size of my high school, and because we had a, I went to a big public high school. Mm. But I, Swanee is the only place I applied, and I got in, and so that's where I went. What was the change of heart? Oh, I didn't have any change of heart. I didn't want to go there. I oh. <laughs> told my parents that I, I was just going to go traveling because I didn't know what I wanted to do in life and I didn't want to waste their money. I was like, I have no idea. Um, and they said, go to college for two years and then we'll help you travel. And so that's what I ended up doing. Swanee, and did you do four years or just two years? I did four years, but I did take my junior year and I went traveling. Yeah. Uh, so I ended up at Swanee for those reasons. I loved it. I mean, it was nature, waterfalls, cliffs. Um, I mean, there's rock climbing and mountain bike and all that stuff. And this is back in the mid eighties, which was, it was very new to me. Mm -hmm. Um, so what else do you want to know? There was a lot. Um, so you ended up there. I would say that was kind of like, a divine thing, right? So the bees went with you. I mean, what were the bees? Did you bring your bees or did you find bees there? How did this all become part of the college chapter? Okay, so so college was great. Uh, again, I loved it there. It was super challenging academically, especially because I'd been to a public school. And this one was, it was a difficult, it was difficult for me. So I certainly struggled, had to work all the time, but it was also a school where people played all the time mm -hmm. too. So it was a good balance. Um, very formal and wear coat and tie. Well, what? Oh, Five yeah. days a week. I didn't, but I got some pushback <laughs> yeah. for not doing it. And then I would some days. Um, and then if at some point you could get a gown if you had the grade. So it was a real, I mean, and if you didn't show up for class, if you missed three classes, it didn't matter. You failed. Um, so you had to show up. I mean, it was, it was serious. Strict. Yeah. Wow. That shocks me that you would go to like a strict college because I feel you're more go with the flow. So how was that being at a college that was so rigid? Well, I mean, I remember as like I just mentioned, I wasn't always wearing a coat and tie and people would be going, you're bucking the system, dinner. Yeah. Giving me some grief in between classes. <laughs> But I had some professors going, oh, that's just fine. You're great. I love what you're, you know. But anyway, I was a little beach hippie up there. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, look, I, I just, it fit right in because I really liked the professors. They were amazing. I learned so much. I got a great education. I mean, I, I yes, I couldn't, I could, we could talk forever about Swanee and how great it is. I would send anybody there. Um and in part because of the size of the school, you know everybody pretty much, um, which is, it's sort of, 
I don't know, counterintuitive because at a big school, you'll think, you know, there's 40,000 people there and you don't, I think you just don't get to know that many people. Whereas in a little school, you know, only a, there's like 1,100 people or something. Yeah. You kind of wow. knew everybody and all the parties were inclusive. And so anyway, Swanee was amazing. Um, and you can't discount the nature component, which is incredible. So you have these huge, like a cathedral, you know, everything's carved out of stone. So it was patterned after Oxford. Um, wow. And it, so it's like a little miniature. You have a big quad where, you know, there's grass and people studying. And, um, and again, you go down, you know, whatever road and you get to some edge of the mountain because it's a flat top plateau mountain. And you can just see forever looking out over the valley. You can watch sunsets. There's waterfalls. It's just it's incredible, incredible place to learn and to like do nature. And so I tell you what I did is, well, I'd grown up on St. Simon's Island and it was sort of, I called it the Isle of Hedonism and it was an easy, easy, easy life. So I was committed to like, bettering myself and so I pretty much quit drinking when I got to college which is the, the opposite, opposite. yeah uh, I was meditating you know and doing yoga and exercising and I mean exercising and I was reading this book where you can live forever and so I was trying to just I mean honestly like <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, <laughs> but like be like Jesus. Yeah. I wanted to like become just spiritually enlightened, and I was just I was working to. I gave up meat back then. I just I was doing. I would fast one day a week, um, and I was <laughs> I was like, and so I'm in this crazy dorm that's like Animal House. <laughs> Literally, it was like Animal House. I mean, crazy stuff going on, um, and then here I am. This this. <laughs> Pushing my, these little spiritual <laughs> talks and all these guys, yeah, lecturing the people watching football to get outside on this beautiful day, and um, it was funny. There, I I ended up in this little top room that had been some utility closet or something. It was so oh, tiny, gosh. but I convinced whoever it was. I had to convince that I could live in there, and I did. And I remember I had incense going. I'm like doing yoga. I'm standing on my head, doing a headstand naked. <laughs> and rusty guy, a janitor, a janitor, whatever the guy coming to clean comes. In. He's like, oh my God. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, no, no problem, Rusty man. Yeah, you can get, you can get that. <laughs> All work. upside down. You had the conversation <laughs> yeah. upside down. Oh my God. And to me, it's like, I didn't care. I mean, of course, in hindsight, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I can only imagine. Anyway, but yeah, that, that town naive and crazy and off the uh, grid. I was, you could say. Um, but yeah, so that was my first two years of college. Was was really naked yoga, enlightenment. Yeah, um, trying to be like the best human you can be. Uh, I was out there and struggling and studying all the time and. Watching the sunset every night. I mean, I it was it was an what, amazing time for sure. What led you to that? I would say kind of an extreme. So and oh, I it was extreme. Okay, and I didn't want to like offend you, but coming from the island where you say it's Lord of the Flies, anything goes, really anything went to becoming an extreme purist. Like, what was the drive to that other end of the spectrum in living? I had that bent, so to say. Um, I think, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm a Sagittarius. <laughs> Maybe because I grew up on the ocean. I don't even know what the connection is, but but so I think I just was kind of born that way in a way. Yeah. And and then my father was influential for sure, and um, like he had given up. <laughs> I'd made pork chops one night. That was like the last meat he'd eat for the next twenty years or something. Wow. Um, but he had given up meat. So, I mean, I sort of followed suit. He had certainly traveled the world. I ended up doing a lot of that. Um, and then he would take us to these meditation classes. So we belonged to a unity church and wow. we would do these meditations and stuff like that. So I think that and read these little books. Uh, 
That's awesome. I mean, I like learning about that stuff. Oh, I was fascinated by it, right? There's another reason I didn't want to go to Swanee because it was an Episcopal school and I didn't want to go to like some church school right. and study religions. Like, so you mentioned I majored in religion. We haven't even got to that. But yeah. I did not. I was, I put off taking any religion class. You had to take one religion 111 and, and I put it off till the last semester I could take it, which was last semester of sophomore year. And Richard, my good friend <laughs> at school, he was like, you're going to love this class. I think, Ted, I don't think you're going to dig it. And so I, 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 you know, whatever, signed up for Religion 111. And we, I think we, we read Nietzsche, um, Sartre, and I don't know, maybe Dostoevsky or somebody. And it was the most amazing class I'd ever taken. I mean, it was so, so super cool. And, and that was Religion 111. I was like, Oh, Camus. We read Camus. Um, so, yeah, amazing stuff. Sorry. It was not like what you think. You think like, oh, religion, you're studying the Bible and the gospel of this. And, yeah. And, but no, it was it was like thought and philosophy and, and what are we doing here and, and different people's perspectives. So ultimately, my I said, wow, I love this so much. I had to declare a major at the end of the sophomore year. I declared religion major. And, and that's, well, that's what it, what I became, what it became. And, but so we studied thought from the very beginning, like when the Vedic, you know, earliest written words, mm -hmm. um, all the way to present, um, which was amazing. So you're studying religion slash philosophy. That's what we've kind of talked. It's more right. like philosophy and you're at this strict college breaking the rules in true Tom Dinnard fashion, right? Because at that this is, point, yeah, no, mention it, yeah. yeah, he'd already represented the student, right? With a ponytail. Right, right. Yeah, he was, yes. Yes, we, I, yeah, I guess we're a little somewhat rebel. Right. <laughs> so you've done this, you're at Swanee, it's the end of your sophomore year. When did the bees happen? So. At, in bees college, happen? yeah. No, no, right. So I think that, that last, was it that semester? So anyway, the middle of the of my Swanee career, I moved off campus mm -hmm. and rented a, a room from the Stapletons, and the Stapletons were this amazing, amazing family. I think I'm saying that a lot, but but they truly were inspirational. And they lived; they had like two thousand acres of land on the edge of the mountain and that went down into the valley, and they had a gigantic garden. They they had asparagus. Planted. They had mm. all kinds of vegetables. They had a flower mm. garden. They had uh, they had bees. They had a vineyard. So oh my gosh! I mean, we made wine. We made mead. We ate from the garden. You drank from the well. So everything was coming right from that property. At that time, I ended up. I was bathing in a pond because this. <laughs> this literally, I was. And so it's like everything I did was right there on the property. And it was, it was so cool to me that you could do that. Like I chopped the wood that yeah. was cut down on the property to stay warm. I had a fireplace in my bedroom. So it was a, it was a 180 year old log cabin. Gosh. It actually, it was two of them and they had moved them there and connected them. Mm. And, and so, yeah, the water, the wood, the heat, the, everything we, was just, just all right there. I have a question about this because I'm genuinely curious. When you're living this primal lifestyle, did you feel ultra connected to like spirituality through that? Because you were living the purest primal way that our ancestors lived. I mean, literally you were bathing in a pond. Yeah. Like think I about that. I laughed at you, but I'm like, this is just instant. I mean, wow. No, I did. I totally did. And, and so I would say that it, I'm sure most people thought I was crazy. I had a big beard. <laughs> And, uh, uh, at the time, I think now know. I'm jealous that you had that experience. Oh my! And it was so it was amazing for sure. I was way, way, way off to one side, and not many people were. <laughs> yeah. But there was a couple of cool professors and some students, and you know, I could relate to. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yes, I was connected. I was calm. I was 
yeah, I mean, um, it was odd just kind of balancing the studies and the and the nature and yeah, the, you know, this little spiritual pursuit. Um, ultimately, yeah, I think I got to a place that was was pretty, like you said, pure. Maybe that's the right word. And and then so and then it, then I had a break, right? So finished sophomore year went traveling and I went to Fiji mm. and I went to um, Australia and I went to New Zealand. And so I spent eight months just traveling. Um, I, I should mention that both summers and my freshman and sophomore summer, I worked in Alaska. I would go up there and work and so I, it was in terrible jobs, but again, I could hike. And so we would, we were working like in a salmon fishery processing salmon and tons of stories there but what we did was hike and you know we went to denali and we we saw some of the most incredible sights ever the wilderness of alaska is pure wild real and you know arguably some of the last wilderness out there on the planet wow. um so that was super cool saved money and then went traveling you know to fiji and <laughs> It was crazy. So I am definitely rambling. So it's not a very good thread here, well, perhaps. No, um, it is because if the Stapletons had bees on their property, were you their beekeeper or were you learning no, no, from I was learning. him? Okay. So go back to the Stapletons. I So wilderness, still in the wilderness, right? Bees, wilderness. We're definitely good, bees and wilderness. Good line here. Um, good transition. Definitely bees and wilderness. So uh no, they taught so they taught me a lifestyle that was was really simple and clean and and um, and really um, it was one that I thought, wow, you can you can have a life like this where you it's you're doing everything right here on the property. Yeah, it's so self sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I it was it was again inspirational to me. So that was cool. And then Archie Stapleton was this patriarch and. He he was all, he was a very learned man, mm -hmm. and he had actually taken his family to the Philippines and done some mission work. And he was, I'm trying to think what is it? he was a very social. Uh, can't think of the term, but he was a retired minister. But he was doing social work, mm -hmm. trying to lift up the the um, the people on the bottom rung of right. the community and mm -hmm. try and bring light. He was. I mean, honestly, he was talking about somebody that did try to do the work that you would think um, maybe Christians would want to do, right? I mean, right. It was like biblical the stuff he was wow. doing to try and help out, um, you know, whatever battered women and or just impoverished people and and trying to get them, you know, lifted out of that. Yeah, he was an activist, a social activist, yeah. right? Yes, that would be a good way of putting it. Yeah. But anyway, so he's very inspirational, um, but but very cerebral, and and so he taught me all the amazing facts about the queen. I didn't know any of that, right? The wow. queen was born a worker bee, fed royal jelly, turns into a queen, um, right? Lives forty times longer, most fertile species on the planet, and on and on, and that she can determine whether she lays a male or female egg. She can fertilize it or not. Um, or it, it's actually in reverse. Fertilized becomes a worker, female. Unfertilized becomes a male, and she she determines that. It's really, it was it was there was a lot to like mystical magic that kind of got swirled in there, right? Know, to me, yeah. And there and there's like one million amazing bee facts that it never stops. But he introduced me to that, made me really become enthralled with with bees and. Mm -hmm. You know, just how interesting they were. It's still mystical and magical. I mean, really, it's like no matter yeah, what yeah. you learn, it's still, it might, it's mind blowing. Um, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I think one thing I can make a connection of is you're living this pure life. I don't want to keep going backwards, but right, you're experiencing yeah. the wilderness, you're traveling. And ultimately, it leads to the mission of what your company is today. I don't know if you've really considered that, but it's like these experiences are directly tied to like the mission of Savannah Bee Company and that pure, like what we're working for, right? I would say that 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 willingness to try and do something that is a little bit outside the box mm -hmm. and that hopefully is good. Yeah. Um, you know, yes. 
to have those those seeds were planted. Um, yeah, for sure there, or they were they were sprouting there. Mm-hmm. I don't know which uh, how you want to put it. I should mention that when I got to Australia, I realized in <laughs> there's there's tons of stories, but basically I realized. Man, I was so out there, like nobody could relate to me because I'm talking about people's spiritual energy and all this stuff. <laughs> and they're like, and I, you know, honestly, I was, I was like, man, forget this. I'm not, you know, I'm just going to be a human. Right. right? Mm-hmm. Why am I trying to be? And like, I had thought, wow, I want to just be a hermit, you know, like go live on a mountain. And Shaman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wait, can you still read spiritual energy? What does mine say? No. No, I'm, <laughs> so so there's, basically, I just threw it all away. Not all away, right? But, you know, started drinking again and... Living. And living. Yeah. Shaved my beard. Came back to Swanee. And there were people that were in my dorm were like, this is the new Ted. Oh my God. Like what happened to the guy that said you could live forever? <laughs> like they were mad at me. Oh, switched. Uh, but I had decided I was going to live life and just, just life is, you know, there's this quote of life is a banquet and most poor fools are starving to death. Mm. Um, and I was determined I was going to live it up and eat yeah. that banquet. And so that's how I, that's what I did for the next, so I'm still doing it. Um, so, but I would think I would like to kind of find a medium between like that person that's just eating life up to, and that person that's just trying to get spiritually awakened. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that'd be a great marriage. I'm still working on that. I think we all are right. Like, Um, I think that's the life mission is that finding that balance, right? Yes. So yeah, that, that, that was so you're beekeeping in college, you're traveling. Did you do any beekeeping while you were traveling? Were you doing any bee work while you were traveling? Or was that pure experience no. and just life enriching travel? I would just be on a walkabout. Walkabout. So you come back, you graduate school. Uh, you're Can cut- I mention also that on my... As soon as I got there, right, I was always, You can mention whatever you want, whenever well, you I want. I was cranking some reggae in my dorm room and so one of the guys that was in charge of the radio station was like man we need a dj why don't you can you do a reggae radio show and i was like hell yeah i can do it so so all four years i had a reggae radio show and that was that was fun yeah that was a lot of fun I just picture, so up to now, I picture all these chapters of your life. We've got like Ted the Sandlot. So like you're running around on St. Simon's Island with like the boys of the island, right? right. Then you're going to school and you're doing naked yoga, talking <laughs> to the janitor, like having a one-on-one. <laughs> then you're, you know, in Alaska and you're experiencing that and traveling. You're living pure. You decide maybe that's not how I want to, you know, continue on things. So you come back and... You're, I assume now we're heading into graduation. Are you still living with the Stapletons? What were your plans after these experiences? What were you thinking? I, I really never have had much foresight of what I'm going to do, but I wanted to join the Peace Corps. Like I was going to give back. Um, and I kind of went into college thinking I wanted to do that. And, and so that is what I did. I was living with the Stapletons loving them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could wax on for a long time um, about how influential they were. But yeah, still there living in that cabin. But I had roommates now. We were having a good old time. Oh, (laughs) man. (laughs) Biking and doing all kinds of craziness. And so I graduated and had joined the Peace Corps, right? I did all the paperwork, did that. And I... I said, I want to go to Fiji. You can list your your three preferences. Mm-hmm. So I said, Fiji, Nepal, and Eastern Africa. And that's what I was, did. And they said, and then I ended up getting whatever, accepted. And and they said, we want you to do beekeeping. But I, they didn't tell me where. Oh. Well, I think one question I have that we really haven't talked about off air is, so... What does the Peace Corps really do? So in my, I always thought that the Peace Corps was 
going into third world countries, feeding the hungry, building homes. I could be completely naive for believing that. I talk to you and you say, well, I was beekeeping in the Peace Corps. And I'm like, wait, hang on. So can we talk about kind of what the Peace Corps is doing, what they were doing and how this works? Do you get to choose the job you want in the Peace Corps? Like everything. Tell me yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in a nutshell, so it was it, it's run by the U.S. government. Mm-hmm. It was started uh, by Kennedy. And honestly, I think it was to serve as a buffer to kind of fight communism, the spread of communism. This is what I, look, I'm, I'm, this is just an, my interpretation of it. Um, but it was a good thing, right? Let's go do good work. Instead of fighting with arms and military, Right. why don't we just send out some emissaries of like, hey, we're good people, we're gonna help you, right? And right. So, hey, I think it's, it's, a, it's, I think it's a great way to spread the word of whether it's, democracy or, yeah. or whatever it is like, Hey, we were do we do good stuff. I say we, but, um, and I think we always have. Um, so, so it is governmental, uh, but it, but I think the purpose is, is at its root is, is still, is still a good thing. It's like through peace and not. Yeah. It. So, yeah. So what do you do? So what, yeah, you, so depending on your skill set. So there was kind of like five, there was agriculture, which mm-hmm. is what beekeeping fell under. Education. There was teachers and stuff that went down there. There was um, people that did. Is that like teachers and doctors without borders? Kind of. Or does that fall under the same? It's not. No. Idea? This is no Peace Corps is its own. So you have the Peace Corps, which is the U.S. government, and then you have a lot of NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Right. That I think Doctors Without Borders would be gotcha. one of those. And okay. A bunch of those. Okay. Right? Um, maybe a little less red tape and stuff involved. But anyway, they, we, I was, they chose, they, out of my skill set, I, I took a lot of forestry classes and, mm-hmm. and I thought maybe I could help do that, like planting trees and sure. denuded lands and, um, but they like, I think there's just not many beekeepers. Right. Because I had listed that as a, a hobby. hobby. They said, oh no, that's what you're going to do. So you don't get to pick what. And you don't get to pick where, but they do give you three preferences. And they so I those are my three preferences. Fiji, Nepal, East Africa. Had you been to all three places? No, I just had been to Fiji. Yeah. What was the draw to Nepal and East well, Africa? Nepal just, you know, well, right, Himalayas. Back oh, well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Ted's growing a beard again. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and in East Africa, I just... I think I'd heard just how beautiful it was. Um, yeah. So you ended up. I ended up like a few months, maybe three months after graduating. And I had not heard. And then all of a sudden I get a letter in the mail. And my One of my roommates, Martin Evans, was he was he lived in the cabin with me mm-hmm. out there at the Stapleton. And he was visiting me and. All of a sudden, I, you know, you get the mail. Yeah. You open. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. Is this it? Yeah. I'm going to see your placement letter. And wow. so I open it up, and I pull it out, and I'm like, oh, my God, Jamaica. I'm going to Jamaica. You're right. <laughs> so, you know, I was ecstatic because, you know, I had this reggae radio show. I had this, like, you know, love for you know rastafarianism yeah all this stuff and i'm so excited and martin's standing next to me and he just rears back and just punches me as hard as he can in the chest and what like, you lucky bastard oh <laughs> yeah he's like you're so lucky i was like yes i am <laughs> yeah and uh so yeah that's how i got the news and i was pumped so Jamaica, you're a beekeeper. When are you leaving? What what are you taking? I'm taking nothing, including my wisdom teeth or my hair. Yeah, it made me cut my hair. Made me take my wisdom teeth out. Wow. I know. I didn't want to, but but uh, did all this paperwork and stuff, and then I didn't leave. So that's probably September. I didn't leave until February fourth. And you land in Jamaica, and what's the first thing that happens? Well, it's lots of <laughs> sights and sounds and yeah, 
smells and it was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> there's so many stories. Uh, there's training. There's three, there's, there was like a multi-week training mm -hmm. and then I did months of beekeeping training. So it was pretty, pretty intensive. Um, so it, it was, the whole group was getting trained in the beginning. There's like an introduction just to the culture and language. I mean, we did all kinds of studies and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what Archie Stapleton had taught you, was it a good foundation for what the Peace Corps was teaching you with beekeeping? Did you feel ahead or did you feel like you were well prepared or? That is a great question. Um, <clears throat> so the Jamaicans have a saying, I'm come like a wasp. And which I mean, he comes like a wasp. He is like a wasp. And the story is the, the wasp went to the bee to learn how to make honey. And the bee said, oh, yeah, I'll teach you. I'll teach you. So first you do, you make this nest, this comb like this. And the wasp started leaving. And the, the honeybee, she was like, where are you going? He's like, I got this. I got this. And she's like, no, you don't. Man, I haven't even taught you the most important part. I need to teach you. He's like. No, come on, come on, I got this, I got this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's like, no, you don't. Hey, yeah, I do, I know. And anyway, that's how I was. I got there, I knew just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so my mom would put it in another, her little mountain country way would be, a little bit of learning is a dangerous thing. And so that's kind of where I was, I think, in beekeeping. I thought I knew everything there was. Man, I knew nothing. So mm. when I got to Jamaica... Roy, you know, Roy had introduced me to bees, fell in love with honey. Archie had introduced me to bees in a different way, and I kind of fell in love with just the the fascination of bees and honeybees and um, and somewhat of the magic about them. And then the Peace Corps is where I really learned how to do beekeeping. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did queen rearing, raising new queens. We we went through hive after hive after hive and we studied management techniques and just that's where I learned. That's actually where I learned to not be afraid of getting stung. I thought, see, anyway, I used to think like, why would you want to get stung? You, I mean, you really don't. Right. Um, and so I wore, had worn gloves. I think I mentioned like how scared I was when I was with Roy. Yeah. I was still scared when I was with Archie. I remember putting my hands in my pockets, you know, yeah. not wanting to get stung. That's what I do. And, and then I get there and they're like, oh, no, you, you can't wear gloves, man. That Nobody will respect you at all. And I was like, man, that's some kind of macho, stupid stuff. Right. You, you don't want to get stung. They were right. And ultimately, I got I had to lose that fear of, of being stung. And I'm that's still where it scared. all happened. Whew, I'm still scared. Uh, <laughs> No, it was good. It was so good. So that I got a great education. Um, and then I, so then what I did, so right, I'm, I'm not building bridges. Um, unless you want to count building people, <laughs> bridges between cultures and people. Right. So I did serve as that ambassador of goodwill for the United States. And honestly, it's a one, one-on-one -on -one thing, like me and this one beekeeper and then me and this ne next beekeeper. So I ended up working with a little over a hundred beekeepers, existing beekeepers, and working with a beekeeping association that had just been newly formed by the, the my predecessor, um, beekeeping predecessor in this area of Jamaica, and and then I ended up teaching beekeeping in five different schools, and then working with this real remote mountain community, doing some economic development, teaching them about and. And beekeeping was going to be one aspect of that. And I worked with these Jesuit monks to mm. do that part. They wow. were based in over there. It was really neat. Tell me about that. I want to and hear about I, the Jesuit monks. That's so cool. Yeah. It was cool. Yeah. It was cool. <laughs> well, one one story was I was asking this guy, and I still I still am not eating meat and I would eat some fish okay. and fruit. So Party Ted was just drinking Party Ted. Yeah. So <laughs> still didn't help. So, I, so I, I was like, man, how do you, like, I'm getting to the point where I don't even want to eat the plants. Like, what about the life of the plants? And he's like, I was like, maybe I should just eat fruit. And his answer, right or wrong, was, Ted, you don't need to worry at all about what you eat because if you were to eat a cow, 
you're transforming the energy that is in that is the life of that so into a consciousness that that cow doesn't have oh. and so by taking that you eat let's just say you eat this steak you're going to take that that's that is going to become part of you you're going to raise the you know enlighten that energy to a higher vibration a consciousness of god and so you're honestly doing a good thing i love that i believe it i'm gonna take that from this conversation i love that i know i thought so too um, that's beautiful so i started eating some jerk chicken there you go <laughs> went right to it and um no he was he was he was neat so you know they were a great community i mean you know they lived real spartan life and they were just trying to help people mm -hmm. again just to lift them up not unlike archie out of out of poverty and yeah. give them you know not just an economic engine but like some purpose meaning so they could feel good about themselves and you were in jamaica for how long two years so it's a little over two years yeah okay so three months of training and then two years of service so were you contracted for two years and then it was yeah. you're released i don't know how the peace so corps works is, so you get that it's a two-year commitment okay so you're not paid um they give you a what are they? so a living allowance and then they give you a readjustment allowance something anyway you accrue like 200 bucks a month that they give you at the end of your service um for you to when you get back to the states to find a place to live and wow like that okay I, I just remember growing up i think every i remember my mom and dad being like scared of me wanting to join it because i think it's it's not for this the week of spirit right i mean you have to really yeah be committed to what you're getting yourself into two hundred dollars a month that's that's not a lot for any time period right i mean you and the, the the Jamaican economy was crashing while I was there. Oh wow! So the Jamaican dollar was six to one when I got there, and it was thirty to one. What? And so what used to cost you know, whatever five Jamaican then cost thirty Jamaican. So I ended up having to borrow my readjustment allowance. I had to borrow so I could live. Wow! I didn't even get my parents to send me a little money just because. And let me, oh, what, yeah. I was not like living in something nice. I was just a little, right. little shack. Yeah, primal and, living again. And yeah, I had a garden, had a hammock. Yeah. And working bees all day. It was incredible. So you've done this for two years. Your contract is up. Are you thinking when I get back to the States or wherever you're going, that beekeeping is where you want to invest your time and your career? Are you thinking you want to come back to the U.S.? What happens at the end of two years for so you? Jamaica is a really rough country. Right. Um, you weren't at Sandals. I did. No, I was not at Sandals. And I I went down there, you know, Peace of Love and Bob Marley and mm -hmm. marijuana, right? And, um, and it was very much not like that. Mm. So it's a dangerous, dangerous island for mainly for the Jamaicans, right? Right. So... There's bars on windows, there's dogs in the yard, sleep with a machete. Even inside your house, you will, a lot of houses have a gate that goes back to the bedroom that they lock at night so that if somebody gets inside, they still can't get back to the people. I mean, it, so you, there's this pervasive fear that you're living with, and that, get, that got really old. So I was looking forward to, to going somewhere away from people. So I wanted to go out west and... Look, Jamaica is a, it's an incredible country. It's beautiful. I mean, of all the Caribbean countries I've been to, and I haven't been to all of them, it's really the most beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, 7,000 foot mountains, beautiful. I mean, just cloud forest, giant ferns up there. You've got, you know, everything, waterfalls, but you also have like, the water is good to drink. All the water is good. You've got, you know, the beautiful Jamaican people. I mean, they are like, I, I would think if aliens landed on the planet and came here, they'd be like, oh, these are the princes and, you know, kings and queens oh, of the wow. planet. I mean, they are beautiful people and like regal. Um, their language is so rich. I love the language in so many, in so many different ways. The lilting speech, 
the the little double meanings they have, you know, and how the like especially the rastas like the twist words. So instead of saying oppressor, like an oppressor would be, you know, whatever somebody's oppressing you, but to them it's like up pressing. And they're like, no, that's, they're not pressing you up. They're pressing you down. It's down presser. Oh. Down presser, man. <laughs> yeah. And so lots of interesting stuff like that, right? So the food is is delicious, mm -hmm. right? They have these fragrant scotch bonnet peppers. They've got uh, the fish, and, and it's, it's, it's really good food. Uh, so, and then all, a lot of the beekeepers I worked with were farmers and so are nearly all of them. So they were giving me vegetables and fruits and, oh my gosh, I mean, it, it's really just beautiful. Um, uh, and then, and then what else? The music, right? <laughs> of course. Right. The music. Um, so all kind. there's just so many great things about Jamaica, but it's a, there's some dangerous folks down there. Mm -hmm. And so, so I was looking forward to leaving there and going out west somewhere in the desert, which is wide open spaces and free of people. That's what I wanted. Did you go? And that is what I did. So I, I got interviewed to work for a wilderness adventure company. And I remember in the interview process, they were asking me, what's, what, what are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? And I really didn't even understand what that question meant. Right. I like, I don't know. And I think I was saying something and I don't, I don't, I don't remember what it was. And they were like, no, I don't, I don't know if that, you don't sound that passionate about that. And, <laughs> and, and they said, tell us about these bees. And so I started talking about bees and they were saying, oh yeah, tell us more about that. Tell us more about yeah. that. And, and, and they're like, oh my God, you, you are passionate about bees. So again, with me, no foresight, I guess no, I don't even know. Um, self-awareness uh i i didn't even know i was passionate about bees yeah but i was i got the job out west and um worked in utah and colorado and arizona for five years wow so beekeeping in the desert right there so in actually i didn't have bees out there but i did set up bees um back at you know that land so you know all of of um roy's bees had died right so mm. I, I i got new equipment and used some of his old equipment and i, I had you know five hives of bees at the okay. property so i would just work when i went back to georgia okay so the bees are happening in georgia you're um what sowing your oats in the west which you wanted to do right like you wanted to get that experience and you so you're kind of going back and forth and the bees are still a part of your life you're do you're living this life four years, right? You said? Yeah, really five. Um, again, I well, I so I say again, I took a a travel time off. So at the end <laughs> of this four five year period, I went with Richard, my roommate, and and my brother, and we all went to Southeast Asia. Oh wow! So we went to Thailand and Vietnam and Laos, um, and then back to Thailand and to Indonesia. You've been everywhere. The best time of my life. Was it? <laughs> yeah, we had the, the best time, hands down. So great. But you always keep coming back to Georgia. Did you notice that throughout like these chapters that you keep coming kind of back? I had, I was like, how could anyone decide where they wanted to live? Like, you know, it'd just be so difficult. Um, cause there's so many incredible places, right? So right. Choosing a spouse, right? There's lots out there. How do you choose <laughs> one? Right. Um, but really I kind of liking it to that. Um, when I was in Colorado, I loved it and I, and I still love Colorado, but it, it gets cold and there's no salt water. Mm. And I just love, I grew up on salt water. I wanted salt water. Mm. So I went to San Diego and went to LA and, and that, that water is cold. Very. And all the time i know i was like damn yeah man this is not like the movies and so i said <laughs> okay check cross that one out not going there texas gulf florida anyway ended up thinking i needed to be back on the southeast coast of georgia 
So after the travel with your brother, Richard, you said someone else, or was it just you three? Just the three of us. Three of you guys, you've done all of Asia, right? Yeah, <laughs> like all of Asia. We did Southeast Asia. In a Southeast, good yeah. You did the great, the you know, fun parts, right? Yeah. The party parts. You come back to Georgia after this, right? Yeah. What's next? What's next? Oh. Well, my brother and Richard had been living as roommates here in Savannah, and my brother, he stayed. Mm-hmm. He went. He he stayed in Hong Kong right before the turnover in '97. Oh we my left gosh. the day before it turned over. Wow! Back to China, um, but he stayed for that and stayed for another three or four months. Went to India and did some cool stuff. Yeah. Meanwhile, Richard and I get back. We had bought 300 sarongs in Bali, <laughs> and we were going to sell them. <laughs> and, and so we get back. We come to Savannah because he just you know they knew. That's what he knew. Right. So we came here, we rented a house, and and we were selling sarongs. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> and, and no, seriously. And That's I just awesome. remember walking downtown, thinking, "Oh my God, I love this place." I even though I grew up um, an hour and a half away, I really mm-hmm. hadn't spent had not spent time in Savannah. Yeah. And so walking these squares and beautiful, you know you know, canopies of live oak trees and moss. And I, I said, I, this is home. This is home. This is what it feels like to find your spouse. I am in love with this place and I'm never leaving. So, and I was like, it was such a relief to think, I find, wow. Of all the this places. Off the list. Yeah. Here I am. I'm home. That's crazy. Of all the places that you went and you felt that here. I know. I, again, if I look back, I swear, I think it was destiny that I needed to, do the B company here. Mm-hmm. But at that point it just felt, I just knew I was, I was here to stay. Wow. So how long were you selling sarongs? <laughs> <laughs> well, we just sort of did that on the side <laughs> among other things. So I, so that I had invested in that wilderness adventure company. I owed 200 and something thousand bucks. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was killed me. So I just wanted to, my partner out there to sell the company and pay off my debt. Yeah. But she, and she did sell the company, but she didn't pay off any debt. Mm. And so I owed all that money. So I came to Savannah after living and traveling and feeling really free and unanchored my whole life. And all of a sudden it was like ball and chain. I owed all this money. I, I didn't have a credit card. I mean, I didn't have a career. I didn't have a job mm. <laughs> to me. I mean, what was I going to do? Right. So I was just working. So I worked a bunch of jobs. So I started taking, um, I took a job with the state that took the adjudicated youth on wilderness therapy trips. Mm-hmm. So I would take, you know, eight kids from the inner city that were in trouble on wilderness trips. Um, so a, a week at a time. And, and that, so that was my, I guess main job. Mm-hmm. I was probably making about twelve thousand a year. Wow! That. <laughs> and uh, they were paying I, you the large, weren't uh, they? <laughs> but I, I was really. I mean, there was work when I was not out in the wilderness with these kids, but not not that much. So I also mm-hmm. had other jobs. So I was resurfacing these bathtubs and countertops, um, driving an old beat up ambulance around. Um, and because it was called Surface Doctor was the name of it. Wow. And this guy, Ed, that I played ultimate with. Uh, <laughs> <he laughs> Want to drive the ambulance yeah, well, in I between did, throws? Man, I did. Oh, I, my gosh. I was doing that. And I was uh, also doing little odd jobs for people, like building cabinets and p- repairing doors and things like that. And I, I started buying really cheap houses, like mm-hmm. $60,000. And then I'd sell them for seventy thousand. Flipped them, yeah. And then just make a little money, and then just get out and do it again. So, um, and and I had five beehives. Okay, so on your resume currently, we have saving lives, helping inner city kids, <laughs> flipping houses, driving an ambulance. Is there anything that Ted was not doing at this point in life? I mean, you are like stacked in all air, the all circles of life, right? I guess it just to me it felt really frenetic and crazy because I just had I was doing so many different things just trying to make my payments and yeah um, get that out of the way and out of your life right that right. debt 
and then yeah and just living life but but i was so it was a little bit depressing so i would say there was a it was i don't know if it even whatever the dark night of the soul but but it was your rock bottom well it wasn't rock bottom so well, I don't that's good because that, i was still happy um well that's good but it was depressing because i did not know what i wanted to do like why had i not studied something practical why did i study religion why do i have no fallback why did i just do all the stuff i'd done in my life that didn't like build some you know foundational you know career or money making venture and and so yeah i kind of regretted that my dad had always told me to do what you love and don't do anything for money how old were you when you were asking these questions 31 yeah i was like that was some terrible advice dad uh, well that's <laughs> funny because i think that's the so there's something for everyone that's woo woo out there called your Saturn return. And it happens usually around 27 to 30, right? And you go through all these questions that you're talking about. What is my purpose? S some people luck out and they sell their company at 22 and they're whatever they are, right? right. But it's more right. common for people to ask these questions at 30, you know, 30, 31 and be like, what does it all mean? Now we that can makes me feel better. Yeah. Now you and I, well, you and I have had this conversation, but we cut to today and we talk about how all of this was purposeful, every single bit of it. And at the time you're sitting with these thoughts, have, I'm guessing you did all of this until you paid your debt off. Correct. I definitely, well, no, I mean, I, I ultimately, so I started the, the B company and that's what I was going to ask. Even, you so know? you started the company before you were at, I mean, what, prompted you to start the B company what was the the turning point from this depression and un, well you were happy but the depression and the questioning right well yeah I had you know I just it just felt heavy like I didn't feel free I couldn't travel I couldn't didn't feel like I could do anything except get up and grind do one of those jobs and make some money and make yeah payment so but I did have the hives and that was great Richard again my roommate is uh he's very logical and he wanted to pay he wanted us to be able to pay for the b boxes so there's a couple things and i had forgotten about this he reminded me of this actually yesterday um and he ordered 300 plastic little honey bears and he wanted to sell honey because it was like 300 400 bucks for these hives of bees that we'd gotten yeah and and I didn't want to sell anything, but he damn, he certainly did. And um, so that was that was one thing. And I, I don't even remember filling any of those bears or. But anyway, but so our other roommate, who was a friend of mine from St. Simon's, ended up being his girlfriend and ultimately his wife. And she opened a store. So we're all living together. We've got these beehives. She opens a store called One Fish, Two Fish, and she sells all this sort of shabby chic furniture that she's buying and fixing up and selling and she put some jars of honey in into her store mm -hmm. and then well and then another store owner saw the honey in there and, and wanted to um, put it in her store and called me and said okay and so I this started doing that so this is the beginning of the savannah bee company story right here so this really is the beginning yeah so of the savannah bee company um, so that that would be in '98. That would be in '98. I, you know, I could be off six months somewhere in there. Yeah. But I started selling honey in 1998, like the holiday of 1998. Well, this is where we are going to end episode two because next episode I want to get into the Savannah Bee Company with you.